Uh, I'm thinking, I know why Pastor Lot was able to be called to this church is because his wife knew how to play the piano. <laughs> the reason I know that is because I know that's why I was called the Gospel Baptist. They didn't necessarily care about my preaching, but they wanted a piano player, and my wife does that, so she's right. kept me going there for a long time. <laughs> well, thank you for that kind introduction, Pastor Lot. I am so thrilled by it, I can hardly wait to hear what I got to say. <laughs> so, that, uh, very kind, but I, Pastor always, every time I get around him, I just, I just start panting because I, his zeal is so great. I just feel like I'm going to get up and do something, you know, and I, uh, I get to be an older man now, so it's not as easy uh, to get up and do something, but I appreciate your Pastor, and he's been faithful for all the time I've known him and continues to be so, and what a wonderful testimony he has not only here, but all throughout, throughout the area with their, uh, their pulpit echoes. They, they, they're widely known, I'm sure. And I'm glad to have his friendship for sure. Open your Bible, please. Numbers chapter 11 this morning. Numbers chapter 11. Well, this is Thanksgiving season. And it is good and right that we spend time in the house of God to just thank God for his goodness to us. Amen. Back in the day, in 1623, the pilgrims had been on the, uh, in Plymouth for now just about three years. But they faced a crisis. The crisis was that they had planted their crops and they had had good crops for a couple years, but now they were facing a terrible drought. There was no rain for some weeks there in that area. It was unusual, but they had no rain at all, and their corn and their crops were wilting in the field. They did what they felt they should do, and as they called the time of fasting and prayer for, his, for the people, and Governor Bradford proclaimed that day as a day of uh, fasting and prayer to meet in the Lord's house from 9 in the morning till 12 at noon to pray for God to be merciful upon them, that they would have rain for their crops. They realized that their very existence depended upon the success of their crops. Well, as they met there, and as the story goes, uh, they were praying and, and begging God to, uh, to do something when they began to hear the patterns of rain on the rooftop of the, of the little meeting house that they lived wow. in. Before long that day, the rains came and continued coming until they had a bountiful crop. So in 1623, when uh, the governor made his first Thanksgiving proclamation, and particularly to give thanks to God for their continued existence and for God's blessing upon their crops. Yeah. And you know, somehow we've forgotten in, a, in America uh, how very indebted we are to our Father in heaven yes. for the success, the freedom we have, even the freedom we enjoy this morning of assembling without fear of persecution and be able to preach the word of God and you having a Bible in your own hand to read and to, yes. and to study. Exactly. What a blessing we have enjoyed in this country for so many years. Yes. May God help us never to lose our gratitude for what he's done. Amen. Now, I'm going to give you a little quiz this morning as we begin. I'm going to ask the Lord to help us uh, first of all, but then I want you to think with me for a moment, if you would. I want to speak to you on a subject. Thank God for manna. Thank God for manna. Father, would you help us this morning? This is such a friendly church and such a happy church. We thank God for it. Thank you for the pastor and wife and all those who labor with him. Thank you, Father, for the good music that we've enjoyed that's lifted our hearts. Thank you for the time of prayer, all the things that you've done to help us today. We rejoice in that. But Lord, we're concerned today that we might be, as some others, maybe in uh, days gone by, that have received all your blessings and then for some reason have lost gratitude, be failed to be grateful. Help us not to be that kind of people. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. Amen. I should check. Am I on? I didn't check. I wasn't on. So am, I'm okay. Am, uh, uh, you gave me that thumbs up. Is that good or bad? Or, you, you, okay. Thank God for you not doing that way. That wasn't a good sign. Uh, back in the day when they decided whether someone should live or die, it was either that or that. So I'm glad it's that. Thank you for that. Okay, here's the quiz. What do these people have in common? Adam and Eve. David. Samson, Lot, Noah, and the children of Israel. <laughs> what do they have in common? Well, you see, they have a lot in common. Well, I'll tell you one thing they have in common. I'm going to give the answer to the quiz right now, so just pay, pay, pay attention with me for a moment. They all received blessings from God. You think about all that they got from the Lord. Think of Adam and Eve. <laughs> Living in a perfect world. No thorns, no stickers, everything was just uh, beautiful, beautiful, no pain. What a time. Think of uh, David. David was a uh, follower of sheep. He was the youngest in the family, so he was a shepherd, a little shepherd boy. And God took him from following the sheep to being king over all of Israel. Yeah. Think of uh, Samson. My, what a man Samson was. 
had godly parents. I believe they, they did the right thing. They said, God, how should we raise this boy? That's a good lesson for all parents to ask that question. Lord, what do you want us to do with this child? We learned early on when we lost our first little baby just at the time of birth. And uh, we had kind of taken for granted that when you, you know, you're expecting, you have children, and they grow up and all the rest. But we realized that children really are a gift from the Lord. And that the fruit of the womb is his reward. And so we begin to realize that when God gave us children, he did give us five more after that, that they really belong to him. And yeah. so we asked the Lord, what do you want us to do, Lord? It's not for our benefit we're raising these children. It's for yours. You're the one that, that deserves the, the glory from the children. And that's what we sought to do. But the point is, Samson was reared by godly parents, but Samson turned away from the Lord. As a matter of fact, that's the common uh, factor in all those lives I mentioned. They all received great blessings from the Lord, but they all failed the Lord in some terrible way. Even though they had received great blessings, each one fell at some point in their lives away from faithfulness to the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I'm concerned about our nation. I don't yeah. like what I see, and, and I certainly don't like what's on the rise. And I'm ashamed it's happened during my watch, if you would. I've been saved now for about 54 years and, and passionate for about 40 or so, 45. And uh, the point is, is that I'm concerned about our nation. But we as a church, God's people, the body of Christ, have a lot of responsibility in this nation. And one of them is we continue with a grateful heart to never forget the goodness of God for us. God had led the children of Israel marvelous ways. Uh, when we know that he delivered them from Egypt, the mightiest power of the day. Then he uh, led them uh, through the Red Sea as, <laughs> by dry land. And then he led them with a pillar of fire and pillar of cloud throughout all those 40 years in the wilderness. And one thing he did that the Bible tells us was a marvelous provision. He provided them with manna. The Bible tells us in Numbers chapter 11. Uh, uh, well, I should go back probably to the time when he provided them manna in Exodus 16. Go back to Exodus 16. Let me, let's start there. And then we'll get to Numbers chapter 11. Exodus 16. The Bible says that he... Uh, Verse 2 of Exodus 16, the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and when we did eat bread to the full. For you brought us forth into this wilderness to kill us whole simply with hunger. And then the, said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. Without going into detail, you remember the story how that God, every morning, manna fell on the ground. And they would go out and gather the manna that they needed for that day. They were not intended to save it up, but they were intended to use what they needed, and everybody got what they needed that day. Amen. On the Lord's Day, on Sabbath day, actually, it was a Sabbath day then, Saturday, the, the, the manna didn't come. But God gave them twice as much on Friday, so they would not have to worry about collecting money, uh, manna on the Sabbath. Well, that was God's plan for his people. For 40 years, they ate manna faithfully. God fed them, and he kept them alive, and he kept them well, and they continued walking for 40 years. But we read over in Numbers chapter 11, some difficult thing happened. The Bible says, when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it. His anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. The people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire was quenched. He called the name of the place Taberah, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? Now manna was not flesh. It was, it was what we might call bread or, or something like that, but it wasn't flesh. So now they're, they're unhappy with God's provision. He said, We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. And the Bible tells us that the people were dissatisfied. God had done wonderful things for them. Don't miss that. God had led them. God had preserved them for these 40 years. God had fed them faithfully. He delivered them from the mightiest uh, army of the face of the earth at that time. And in all of that, God had been showing his goodness to them. But now they are grumbling and complaining because they're tired of manna. Now, I want to suggest to you that I see several things that are probably very characteristic of people that walk away from the Lord. Yeah. It's not because God is not good. It's not because God has not been good to them. But something happens in their life that they begin to doubt or murmur and complain against God for whatever reason. And that's when they begin, God has to deal with us right. in that way. You say, why are we dealing with, way back in the Old Testament, 
Well, the Bible tells us these stories or these accounts were written for our admonition yes. upon whom the ends of the world are come, which means that God put this in the Bible so you and I will be warned, just like we'd be warned if we were approaching some sort of a pothole and, and someone put up a sign, they're warning pothole. We say, well, thank God for the warning. And uh, that's why God put that in the Bible so you and I be warned. What I'm saying is there's not a person here this morning, including this preacher, who could not fall because of ingratitude and ungratefulness to the Lord. Amen. As soon as we allow our hearts to become ungrateful, we become ungodly. And I'll explain that in just a moment, if you will. But uh, the danger is for all of us, some of you have been saved many years. Some of you maybe have been saved rather recently. Maybe some of you are sitting here this morning, you're wondering what salvation is all about. I want to tell you this morning, there's not one of us that could not fall just like Adam and Eve did, just like Samson did, if we, get, if we forget the goodness of God in the land of the living. Now, Heavenly Father, help us, I pray, this morning as we think about this subject. For Jesus' sake we ask. Amen. I'm going to give you three things this morning, and I want you to pay attention as I give them to you. Number one, I want you to notice in verse, uh, chapter 11, the Bible says, verse 4, the mixed multitude that was among them fell lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? Here's the key in this whole matter of staying faithful to the Lord. First of all, you have to be careful who you listen to. Yeah. The mixed multitude were people that had come out of Egypt. They somehow attached themselves to the Jews because they could see that God's hand was upon them. And they were evidently not necessarily people of faith. They weren't necessarily Jews. But they were mixed multitude. They follow along at a distance from the camp. Now, <clears throat> the mixed multitude, uh, they were benefiting by the attachment that they had with Israel. But now they, they began to think back to Egypt. They began to think back to all the delicious food they had in Egypt and all the things they had before they left Egypt. And now they started to say to their neighbor, boy, I tell you, this isn't like it was back in Egypt. I mean, this is what God gives us. <laughs> he puts this man on the ground and we got to eat that. I'm kind of hungry for a change of diet, you know. This is getting old. This is getting weird. I don't know much like what God has done. And so the first problem they had is they began to listen to the mixed multitude that was among them. Now, the interesting thing is, the very thing that the mixed multitude was saying, God's people started saying. Yeah. You've got to be careful who you allow to influence your life. Amen. You know, we're living in a day of, of almost instantaneous influence by anybody on the earth, but through our internet and through all the things that we have to connect us with the world. And we begin to start thinking like the world around us. We start thinking like maybe God's not in control or maybe God doesn't care about his people or maybe we have to, to you know, uh, huddle down and, and, uh, <laughs> and just kind of hunker down so that we don't die or something. You know, that's the way the world is thinking. They're frightened. But God's people ought not be frightened. God's faithful. Amen. He's faithful. He's always been faithful. Always will be faithful. Amen. He's led us through all these wilderness and he'll continue to do so. But the mixed multitude will get you wondering. Now, don't let the world do your thinking for you. Amen. Don't let, uh, they don't, you don't need to believe what the ads say that you need to be happy. I want to show you something just a minute. Would you go over to Book of Ecclesiastes real quickly? If you can't find it real quickly, I'll, uh, I'll read it to you. Here's a fellow who had everything, anything that he wanted. I mean, everything. You got, you notice in your Bible. The Bible says, in, in, and I'm talking about Solomon. He wrote this book of Ecclesiastes. And listen to what Solomon had to say. I'm going to read a couple of verses here. He said in verse 10, Whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. I don't suppose there's anybody here that could say anything I wanted, I got. But Solomon could say that. As a matter of fact, I believe God put that in there for you and me, because he says in the next verse, Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, but there's no profit under the sun. Vanity is just nothingness. It means nothing. It's worth nothing. He said, after I did everything, and if you read back through chapter 2, that's an interesting little study there. He had musicians. He had entertainers. He had buildings. He built, he built huge, uh, huge edifices. And anything he wanted, he did. He, had, he didn't do anything. Anything my heart wanted, he said, I gave. I, had, I, I, I was able to get. But he said, it's all the enemy. Now, I want to tell you this morning, that you save yourself a lot of trouble if you don't let the world do your thinking for you. Amen. The Bible says... They're not covetousness, covetousness, wanting what other people have, you know. <laughs> Somebody said, you better be careful before you start trying to keep up with the Jones to find out where they're heading. Yeah. Uh, but let not covetousness be one thing among you which become the saints. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. 
In other words, if you're not satisfied with Jesus, there's nothing on earth that's ever going to satisfy you. Wow. The world will tell you, and now we're heading into the season of buying. And everybody's going to tell you all the sales that you ought to have, and you better get, and it's going fast, and you got to get in there, you know, and we line up at the Lord, and rush in to get our investment, and we think, well, if I get that, well, I'll be happy. You'll find out that doesn't make you happy. We're like a little kid with a new toy. The first 15 minutes, he loves it, and the next uh, rest of his life, he doesn't care much about it. He plays with the box instead of the toy, you know what I mean? That's a little bit like, well, why? Because we listen to other people telling us we need something that we really don't need. They listen to the mixed multitude. Oh, we need some leeks and onions and garlic. We need some fish. No, no, you don't. You need what God's provided for you. So that's the first problem they had. And that'll be our problem, too. There's a young man who was in our church back in Minnesota. I pastored Minnesota for nine years. And he was a good man. He, uh, God had uh, saved him, and he was, he was just busy for the Lord. Then he felt got, he ought to go off to Bible college. And he, he did. He headed off to a good Bible college. And uh, I heard from him on occasion. He would tell me how things were going and how he was learning. And I was so excited for him. But he came home after that first year, and his, his mind had changed some. Uh, he wasn't any more uh, so interested in the preaching as he once was. And, he, and I, I, got, I got talking to him. I said, tell me about your life. About, oh, he said, I met a friend. I met a friend, and he, he, was, he, was always, he had a great influence upon me. And I found out this friend wasn't a good friend. It wasn't the kind of friend he should have. And this guy began to change his attitude, not only to the church, but to me and to the Lord. And I hate to say it today, but after having been married for some years, they divorced and have no uh, interest in things of the Lord. What happened? I'll tell you what happened. He began to listen to the wrong people. Right. He listened to the wrong person. He allowed someone to get close to him to lead his mind astray. And that's what happened to the children of Israel. God had been good to them. God had been marvelously good to them. No place in the nation on earth had been as uh, favored as was Israel. But the old mixed multitude says, there's a problem here. And then the God's people began to say, there's a problem here. Be careful who you listen to. Uh, I wish it were true, and I, I certainly thank God for this church, and, and uh, that I've been around churches long enough to know that not everybody in church always loves the Lord like they should. Right. And I know of one or two that start murmuring and complaining about, well, I just thought the music was a little long, or I just thought, you know, we ought to do something different. I don't like what the pastor said about, okay, and you start murmuring. Be careful about being influenced by that kind of thing, because right. it'll spread. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened to the children of Israel. God had to deal with them because they began listening to the mixed multitude. But notice, if you would, the Bible tells us in verse 6. <clears throat> the Bible says, Now our soul is dried away, and there's nothing at all beside this man before our eyes. So not only had they listened to the mixed multitude, but they began to despise what God had provided. Yeah. That's an amazing thing. They actually told God, We don't like your provision. Skip over to Numbers chapter 21 and notice this verse with me, please, because this kind of helps draw in. Numbers 21 and verse 5. And you'll notice this. The Bible says, And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And watch this, our soul loatheth. That's a strong word. It means despise that, this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people died. Of course they did. Why? Because they despised what God had provided. Not only had they listened to the next multitude, but now they're dissatisfied with Almighty God. By the way, when you reject, when they rejected manna, they rejected the will of God for them. They say, we don't like what God is doing in our life, but we're, we're against this manna, and we hate it. And that happens oftentimes to people when they despise what God has provided when they rejected manna, they rejected the will of God. When they rejected the will of God, they rejected God himself. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? People that are slaves to sin will not murmur and complain about sin. But people that are serving the Lord oftentimes will murmur and complain about the Lord. Wow. It's a hard time. You may be going through a hard time, and people will. <laughs> Can I tell you this? Man is born unto trouble, says Parks Lyford. We heard this morning about a family that's having to lay a little baby to rest this afternoon in a funeral. That was a heartbreaking thing. People have gone through, people in this church, people in this auditorium have gone through hard times, difficult times. I know that. I watched some people this morning I know personally have gone through some hard heartbreaks. But I want to tell you, there's, there's, no, <clears throat> there's no benefit to us in becoming dissatisfied with what God brings our way, right. what God provides us. Because when we dissatisfy with God's provision, we become 
dissatisfied with God's person. And God is good to us. We confess that, don't we? God has been good. God is always good. And God will continue to be good because God is good. God is faithful because that's his name. That's his character. God is good because that's his character. And though you and I are going through a hard time, as was the children of Israel, and though people around us may be murmuring and complaining and saying, we don't know what God is doing, we, we don't like what God is doing, we can trust the Lord in every situation. The reason they got away from God, the reason God had to deal with these people, first of all, because they listened to the wrong people, they listened to the next multitude, and then they despised what God had provided. Yeah. And you're in a hard time, don't rebel against the will of God. Yeah. We're going through a hard time. My wife and I and our, our family had yeah. through a difficult time in our church, and I had pastored the church for many years, but we had ran into some difficulties, and uh, <clears throat> it was a hard time for us. I wasn't sure how, what was going to be the future. I didn't know what my future. Yeah. And uh, I remember sitting in our home after a very per particular contentious time, and my grown children. There are two of my grown children are in our church, and and uh, and uh, my wife. And we were kind of looking at each other, just wondering what's happened next. And it came to me with this, this thought, and I'm, I'm grateful it has, and I think the Lord, Holy Spirit is the one who brought to my mind. He says, uh, family, we have one responsibility, only one. We don't know what's going to happen. We have no idea what's going to take place, but we have one responsibility, and that is to bring glory to God. Amen. Whatever we do, whether we eat or drink, we're to bring glory to God. Amen. And folks, that's all of our responsibility. Whatever your situation may be, whatever the difficulty you're going through, whatever the heartbreak, whatever the illness, whatever the tragedy, understand whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we're to do all to the glory of God yeah. and we're to bring him glory. But you know, one day that's all that's going to matter is whether yeah. we brought glory to him. It won't matter what, how much, how, what home we lived in, it won't matter what car we drove, it won't matter what our salary was. What will matter is whether we glorify God in our life because that's why he saved us yeah. to bring glory to himself. Years ago, I was studying engineering. That was my, my thought after I got out of high school. I wasn't saved yet. I went to engineering school because I wanted to make a lot of money, live in a nice home, drive a nice car, of course, the American dream. <laughs> well, I got almost through that, and I got saved. Actually, I, I threw a long story. I told my the class this morning I got saved in December of 1968. That was two years after I graduated from high school, so I was right in the middle of engineering school. And after I got saved, and a year later, I was married uh, to my dear wife, who we've had the wonderful privilege of being married for all these years. Because she plays the piano, I get to preach. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, <clears throat> where was I going with that? Uh, <clears throat> of all the things I've lost, I miss my mind a little bit. Um, the, the, um, whatever, we, uh, well, anyway, I got saved. So we got, I got saved, and I, so I was in engineering school, and all of a sudden, it kind of lost its luster. I began to think in terms of eternity, not just time. And I realized, I always thought I'd live a long time, and you know, that's what life's all about, just having everything you want in life. And then I began to realize, after I got saved, hey, eternity's a long time. <laughs> Matter of fact, it's a real long time. Uh, it's so long I can't even comprehend it. And all this life, the Bible says, is a vapor that appears for a little time and vanishes away. Now I got to thinking about that. I said, now wait a minute. <laughs> what sense does it make to be a rich person on this earth and be a pauper in heaven? To live for myself now and uh, regret it for all eternity. Right. Well, God began to work in my heart that way. And so we, we joined a little church there in Danville, Illinois, and got busy. The pastor said, we need a Sunday school teacher. I'll be a Sunday school teacher. We need some choir members. I'll be a choir member. What? Well, you say, what? Well, what was No, I just, I just couldn't, get, couldn't do enough for the Lord after what he'd done for me. He saved me. And, and I began to want to use my life for something that outlasts my life. Amen. Well, it wasn't long before God began working in my heart about preaching, about uh, serving full time. And then as soon as I graduated, I went off to Bible college, Bible seminary, and the rest is his history. Now the point is this. I, I'm not a rich man. I, God has met our needs, and you can tell I eat regularly. <laughs> I'm thankful for that. I'm grateful for my children. They love the Lord. I'm grateful for that. They're all in church this morning. All the grandchildren are in church this morning. But, but the fact is, is that uh, I, whether that ever happens to me on this earth, I've been healthy all my life, actually. I've never laid in a hospital bed, never had surgery. Uh, I mean, I, I still have my tonsils, which is an amazing thing. Uh, but the point is, is that God's been very good to me, but I, this world is passing quickly. Right. And I, I'm going to be gone soon. I know that. I'm 74 years old, and I know my, most of my life behind me, not in front of me. But that, that bored me at all, because I, I didn't live my life for this life. I lived my life for the eternity. Yeah. And I'm not going to be unhappy that I just accepted everything God had for me in my life. It's being from the Lord and said, okay, God, 
You're, you do what you need to do. I'm going to give glory to you. Amen. Live, live for your glory. See, the first problem they had was they were listening to wrong people. Yeah. Second problem they had, they began to despise what God had done for them. And the third problem they had, we find in verse, verse 5, back one verse there. And that is, he says, we remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers, the melons, <laughs> and uh, the leeks and the onions and the garlic. They remember all that. And they began to desire what God had not provided. Now notice that. They began to listen to the next multitude. They began to despise what God had provided. And they began to desire what God had not provided. Mm -hmm. Now there's a danger, brethren. Right. I, I, I've pastored for a long time. And, and pastored young people. Single young people. And they'll come, Pastor, I, I just think I need a wife. I need a, oh, a husband. I said, well, I think that's a good thing. But don't, don't jump ship. Just you know, we have one dear lady who was at our Christian school years ago, and that was her goal in life. I just want to get married. That's all I wanted to do, just get married. And uh, she did, and she married a guy that was not the right guy. Yeah. And it, it yeah. brought great heartache. I see her even now sometimes, and she just, uh, it, it so sad is my heart. But that was all she wanted to do. She didn't care about the will of God. She didn't care about God. She just knew she had to have a husband. Now, I believe God. We've had some wonderful things. Actually, the pastor who's pastoring our church right now, his wife had gone to, Bible college as a single lady, actually went to our school and then went to Bible college as a single lady, went back to work for her dad for a year or two, then came down to be our secretary for some time. And uh, she was a single gal, and I don't know exactly how old she was when she got married, but all of a sudden God brought this, uh, this two-legged guy across her path, and it was the will of God, and God, and they've been happily married now for some 20 years. She waited because she was willing to wait and see what God had for her. She didn't want what God did not want for her. That's a wonderful Amen. lesson for all of us. Amen. To desire what God provided. I see people, you know, uh, we're, as I said, we're living in this day. And maybe I shouldn't bring up this thing of Black Friday and all the rest because it's such a big thing, you know. Uh, but I, people, somebody said, boy, my credit card's going to get worn out this Friday. I'll tell somebody to say that. You know, what, you know what interest is? Interest is the price you pay for buying something before you can afford it. That's what the interest is. Yeah, right. And unfortunately, there'll be a lot of people who will be glad to, to pay interest to somebody just for the privilege of having something they can't afford. Yeah. And let me say, brethren, I'm, and I'm not talking about finances this morning, but that's what life's all about. Be content with such things as you have, for he has yeah. said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Amen. Content will buy you anything you want. As soon as you're happy with what you have, you'll be completely satisfied. But discontentment, you'll never be happy. That's what Solomon found out. He said, I just kept thinking, there's something else out there that will make me happy until I finally had everything I could think of and then found out it was all vanity. No, you can have everything you need today as long as you're content with what you have. You have to be careful. You have to be careful letting the mixed multitude destroy your gratitude for all God has done for you. If you're saved this morning, you are a wealthy person. You know how many people live on this earth today and breathe God's air that do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, as their Savior? If you know Christ and you know him at your home, you are a very wealthy person. Amen. You may be here this morning like I was. I sat in the church, listened to preaching, and I kept thinking, well, I'm probably good enough because I'm a good boy. I want to tell you something. There's nobody good enough to go to heaven. Right. And that's why Jesus had to go to the cross to pay for your sins. And when you and I realize how wicked we are, and we can realize how great Jesus is and how much he died to save us. Yeah. He, you can be saved this morning. I can assure you that. But let, let me warn you this. You can keep from falling by doing two things. First of all, be content with what God has provided you. Did you know God is omniscient? He knows what's good for you. Amen. Did you know God is omnipotent? He can do what's good for you. And do you know God is love? He wants what's good for you. Amen. All that's true. And you can be content with everything God has. Be content with your home. Don't be dissatisfied with your home. Thank God you have a home. <laughs> we went for a week without a well, furnace last week. Uh, some park went bad, they couldn't get it. And uh, I need to tell you, I'm thankful for heat today. Whew, so grateful. Uh, and I mean, I'm not kidding, I'm just grateful. Sometimes God has to take things away from us just to remind us how grateful we ought to be for those things. Well, be content with God's provision. Be thankful for your status in life. Uh, I know some of you are widows and widowers, some are single, some are married, and uh, don't ever de begrudge where you are. Be thankful where you are, just thank God for that. God knows what he's doing in your life, in my life, and we can be grateful for that. So don't, don't be ungrateful. And then, secondly, keep your desires in line with the will of God. 
The Bible says this, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he will give thee desires of thine heart. The very thing that, <clears throat> that's most important for us is to come back to delighting in the Lord himself. Because when you have the Lord, you have, you're a rich person, and you really have everything you need. God will meet our needs, for sure, but he always does it on his time. Amen. Paul says, I'm not going to let anything overpower me. He says, I will not be brought under the power of any. Whatever's, whatever it is that motivates you to think you can have something else that God has not provided, just let God have it. If you have a need this morning, let God know about the need. If you're dissatisfied with your lot in life, just say, God, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm ashamed to say that I'm, I've not been satisfied with where I am. Please help me to be content. It's a wonderful way to go. Because those men and women that I mentioned to you earlier, they were great. They were blessed of God in so many wonderful ways, more than maybe any of us have been. But they all fell because they began to listen to the mixed multitude, because they began to despise what God had provided for them. And then they began to desire what God had not provided. May God help us not to be that way. Oh, may the Lord help us. Let's bow our hearts for prayer. Father, we're grateful this morning, and we bow together, acknowledging your goodness to each of us, individually and as a, as a church. Thank you for this church. Thank you for leading this, your pastor and his wife to this place. Thank you for faithful people who uh, are part of the body of Christ, each one, members in particular. Lord, I know that just as well as 